I think that at this present time when we're commiserating or commemorating 200 years after the abolishment of slavery, there's something that resonates to me about my time in Guantanamo in one of the discussions I had one of the guard, with one of the guards from the U.S. Virgin Islands when I was in solitary confinement and the only people I had to speak to were U.S. guards or interrogators. And one of the things we spoke about, I remember, he was a, somebody of, of African origin. I asked him what his origins were and where he came from. And he said, somewhere in Africa, West Africa probably. And I said, do you know that the last time in history that people were t taken from West Africa in chains by the Americans to the Americas, most of whom were Muslim to begin with, was slavery, because the second time is now in Guantanamo Bay. And I remember him saying that I can actually relate to that completely, because September the 11th was the first day in our history as black people that we got a break, because now it's your turn, the Muslim community around the world. And when we're talking about sort of how slavery and how that resonates today with a demonized community. It also resonates with something my lawyer in, in, in Guantanamo told me. He said that the Soviets were feared by the Americans because of their power and their ability to launch nuclear strikes against the United States of America or their conventional weapons forces that were based in Eastern Europe. But they never hated them as such because culturally there was some relative similarities. But with the black people, they never feared them either, because they'd already subdued, subdued them. The African Americans had been subdued terribly, but they hated them. And with you people, i.e. Muslims, they not only hate you, but they fear you too. And this is the world that I'm living in and growing up in right now, a world of hatred, and a world of fear. Some of it may be truly based in relation to terrorism, most of it is spin. I come from the city of Birmingham where all sorts of plots and um, terrorist schemes have supposedly been dreamt up. And one of the cases in Birmingham recently that was paraded in the newspapers and the media and continuously told to the country that British Muslims were planning on kidnapping a soldier, a British Muslim soldier, and planning to head, behead him Baghdad style in the streets of Birmingham and to have it videoed. And the screaming headlines were the day Baghdad came to Birmingham in the Times, for example. And in the, and in the BBC and on ITN and on Sky, it was continuous. The area of Alam Rock was besieged, the area of Spark Hill was besieged by cameramen talking about this alleged terrorist plot. Now, one of the people that was arrested, I know personally well, and I went on record to say that I know that as far as he's concerned, there is no plot. And I would ready to, I'd be ready to stake <coughs> my life on that, as far as he's concerned. And lo and behold, within five days, he and several other people were released, and they weren't even questioned about any plot at all. So this is the type of spin that has been taking place since my return from Guantanamo Bay, Included also in this type of spin, we hear the Ricin plot. And you hear now also that the, the jurors in the case of the Ricin plot now are friends with some of the accused because of the travesty of justice that they saw taking place. That there was no Ricin to begin with. And there are other cases, the airline plot, whatever became of that. But all of this is part of a spin, and today we hear that the wife of Muhammad Siddiq Khan has been arrested, and I don't know what for. I'm not here to defend anybody, but the reality of the fear and the hatred of the times we're living in, we're in is very manifest for people like me and others. And it is very, very difficult to deal with this because it's like becoming a suspect community. One of the things I learned recently, since my return, I've been to Northern Ireland three times on three occasions, and I'd never been there before. And one of the times I went there, I was greatly honoured by the people of Derry, greatly honoured, because they built a museum to commemorate the deaths of the 17 people killed on Bloody Sunday, the massacre. And I was met just at the airport by one of the brothers who'd, uh, of the people who had died that day. And when I came to the museum, when they were doing the opening, they put my name on the plaque. 
and I was opening it. And in the audience, there was Jerry Adams, Martin McGuinness, Bernadette Bukowski, Eamon McCann, the, 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 the figureheads of the Republican movement. Come to listen to me, as if I had anything to teach them about struggle and about being oppressed or about being a suspect community. And one of the things that I saw Martin McGuinness yesterday on the television, now sharing power at Stormont, and one of the things he said to me after I told him that sometimes I feel really dejected because of this antipathy and pointing figures at my, the community that I'm a part of consistently and continually, he said, Mozam, don't be dejected, don't be afraid, because it will come to pass eventually, and people will eventually, eventually see reason. And who was I talking to? <coughs> Martin McGuinness was a former leader of the IRA. And yesterday, on television, I saw him sitting with Tony Blair and Ian Paisley. So what a paradox. So are we saying now that terrorism works? Are we saying now that one is acceptable and one isn't? The IRA, had it not been, Al-Qaeda, had it not been for September the 11th, would have looked like something from nursery or Jack and Ori compared with IRA, with the amounts of attacks that they'd done just on the British mainland alone. If you remember the Brighton bombings, if you remember Canary Wharf and Manchester and Enniskillen and, the, and Birmingham and the myriad of other attacks, the IRA carried out on the British mainland unashamedly as, as what they con considered was acts of war. And yes, plenty of civilians were killed. So the spin we're told today is that the ideology, i.e. a form of Islam, that is the problem. That is the enemy. That is what must be tackled. And I accept fully that there is, there is within the Muslim community people who are ready to carry out acts of terrorism. But to blanketly paint a whole race or a whole uh, a faith of people which is being done inadvertently with terminology like we hear extremist Muslim jihadists. And you take the word for example jihad because it's the word that everybody likes to use and demonize. But let me take you back a little bit in time. Just to the time when the Soviets occupied Afghanistan. The word jihad comes from the Arabic jihada, which means the struggle, and li in, in, in literal terms it means the struggle. In legal Islamic terms it means to fight a holy war, amongst other things, including the internal struggle. But also from that word derives the word mujahideen. And when you think of mujahideen, you don't think of people who are internally struggling. They are externally struggling. And the first time it was used in the West, or in, in recent times, was when they were struggling externally against the Soviet occupiers of Afghanistan. The only thing is, at that time they were lionized by the likes of Sandy Gall, by the likes of Sylvester Stallone in Rambo 3, when he comes to uh, help and support the, the brave and ferocious and courageous people of Afghanistan. And another thing, the Mujahideen, from where we get the word jihad and jihadist and so forth, were trained and brought to the mountains in Snowdonia and in the highlands. But they weren't trained by any ordinary British group or, or fighting force. They were trained by the SAS. And the SAS said of them that these people, it was easy to teach. It was like teaching people who understand warfare in the mountains. Now the British gave them a the blowpipe anti-aircraft missile to bring down the HIN-24 helicopters that were wreaking havoc on the Afghan villages, destroying men, women and children indiscriminately. But being British, the blowpipe anti-aircraft missile turned out to be crap. <laughs> and no wonder then, the CIA brought in something that's become now synonymous with Afghanistan resistance, and that is the Singer anti-aircraft mm -hmm. missile, which brought down scores of mm. helicopters, uh, devil's chariots as they were called, and changed the course of the war. Now, think about it. All of these weapons and training and so forth was provided well up to the late 80s and early 90s. So at what point can we turn around and say that these jihadists or these mujahideen became jihadists? And is it fair to say that every single person who accepts the concept 
of jihad as it was against the Soviet Union now is deemed to be a terrorist. These are the types of issues that are being exploited by the people that are in power and we are made to feel that something that's intrinsically part of, of his, the history of the Muslim peoples is now so demonized that when you, when you look at him or her, you see a terrorist, you see somebody who's backwards, you see somebody who wants to take us back in time to the Dark Ages. And this is the type of spin that we're being offered by the people in the government. I want to tell you though something in relation to hope, because it's, it's very easy to talk about all the bad things and the negativity and so forth. But one of the, things why I'm, one of the reasons why I'm involved with the Stop the War movement and why I bother to turn up to their talks and events is because something happened that was quite bizarre in Guantanamo when I was in solitary confinement. And I'd been in solitary confinement for almost two years. When I say solitary confinement, I mean no access to any other detainee. The only people I had to speak to were soldiers or interrogators or the odd medic every now and then. And one of the soldiers who came from the Alabama unit, Alabama unit who was somebody who'd served two tours of duty in Vietnam as a volunteer, not as a draftee. He went back twice fighting for his country what he believed that he was doing at the time. And he was a typical good old boy, a sudden redneck. Somebody who quite openly talked about how many guns he had back at home. And who openly talked about how he really disliked the Democrats and these liberals and so forth. But he told me something that gave me the first real ray of hope in Guantanamo. He said, millions of people have marched in Yarl streets back in Britain back in London, millions of people against the war, a war that I was not really told about. I didn't know much about the Iraq war at the time because we were, as detainees, not given any access to current affairs information. And when he told me that, I, must, I, I understood that if people are opposed to a war in Iraq, they must be opposed also to the nasty byproduct of that war or those wars in Afghanistan also. And Guantanamo is one of those nastiest byproducts of those wars. Abu Ghraib is another one. And the ghost detention sites around the world where people are held before they go to Guantanamo are also nasty byproducts of these wars. So that gave me some hope. It gave me a great deal of hope, in fact. And this soldier, who was a paradox in a sense because he was a Republican, he's part of Bush's support base but he couldn't stand Bush. And the reason why he couldn't stand Bush is part because he said he was an old soldier. He understood why and how you lose the war and the battle for hearts and minds, which he believed that President Bush had lost a long time ago. And he said that I don't understand how is it possible that all of you people in Guantanamo are being held here without charge, without trial, not treated as prisoners of war, if this is a war, which I don't think it is, I don't understand how you can all be responsible for September the 11th because after all, Guantanamo was set up directly as a response to September the 11th. And yet not one person to date from Guantanamo has been convicted of any crime, let alone convicted of anything to do with September the 11th. Not one person out of the over 1,500 people that have passed through there or those 385 that remain. And in Guantanamo, here's another paradox. One of the lawyers who came and saw me, he said that he was being driven by military personnel past an iguana. And he swerved to avoid the iguana because he said, if I'd hit that iguana, I would have to pay a fine of $10,000 because the iguana is protected. It has human rights. <laughs> or iguana, or lizard rights. <laughs> reptilian rights even. But the detainees, if he was to strike the detainee of which many have been struck, he would expect nothing, perhaps a pat on the back, perhaps even get to go to combat stress where he gets a few days off because he can say he was letting off steam because of the pressure in Guantanamo of dealing with these terrorist types. The right for habeas corpus, which is an intrinsic right, that most people in the Western world and even the Eastern world have accepted something exported from this country. 
In fact, I remember when Gordon Brown actually talked about let's have a day that celebrates Britishness, modelled ironically on a French day or an American day. But celebrates Britishness. And a poll taken out, I think, by the CBC said that everybody agreed, or the majority of the people said that the day that is, or the, the thing that is most synonymous with Britishness is the Magna Carta, the rights given to people. And the central pillar of that Magna Carta was habeas corpus, the right to the body, the right to be presented to court and not be arbitrarily held by anyone and told what crime you've committed or to be released. These have been taken away by President Bush's executive and military powers that he forced upon his nation and the rest of the people around the world. So that people in Guantanamo Bay do not have the right for habeas corpus. They do not have any rights. Everything that's bestowed upon them is, quote unquote, a privilege. And I can tell you, amongst the privileged items that you get in Guantanamo, in the cell, is a toothbrush that big. Because anything bigger than that could be used as a weapon. Toothpaste, which is that small and see-through, so that you can't hide anything in it. Toilet paper is a luxury item in that you can't have toilet, a toilet roll in your cell. It can only be dispensed. So they come along and say, M actually they're called MPs. And because a lot of uh, so toilet paper is, is the, um, described by a lot of detainees as TP. So you often hear detainees saying, MPTP. And they come along and dispense a few rolls or a few uh, cutoffs of this toilet paper. To have toilet paper in your cell is a privilege. And these are the types of rights. I remember from the day I was taken into custody, I was told, you have no rights. And it's also part of a process. Removing people's rights, because you remove not just their normal rights, you remove their human rights. And the reason why you're able to do that is because of a dehumanization process that begins right from the top, from President Bush and Rumsfeld and Cheney and those of his ilk. And that is, when you've already told the world that these people are the worst of the worst, which I, we've said about me personally, that these people are the most dangerous terrorists on earth, so you should be quite privileged because I'm one of the most dangerous men on earth here speaking to you and no ordinary person said that. It was the most powerful and arguably the most stupid man on earth who has said this of me and many other people. So it's already, been, it's already begun. The dehumanization process has already begun. He said that these people would bite through the cables of an airplane just to try to bring it down. He said that these people... And again, of me and others, he said, in the way that only President Bush can, I'm, I don't know what these people have done, but I know they're bad men. <laughs> and that's quoted. That he's, he's on record for saying that. He's on record for saying lo a lot more stupid things too. So once that's begun, once the ordinary soldier hears these type of statements from those people in power, then the abuses that you hear about and the abuses that you don't hear about are all too easily carried out by people who feel that they're completely and utterly justified in carrying out these types of maltreatment. And no wonder, when I was held into US custody and taken into US custody, the types of processes I underwent, if you were to bring me a photograph of Abu Ghraib and to tell me, without mentioning that the Americans were involved, and say, who do you think, out of all the nations on earth, who do you think carried this out? I would have easily been able to tell you, Americans. And that, for me, was one of the greatest shocks. I didn't expect America would, American soldiers would behave in this way. I met American soldiers, plenty of them, who didn't believe that they could behave in this way. And yet, because Rumsfeld says things like, I stand for eight hours a day, why can't they? But what he doesn't say is that when they, meaning us, are made to stand, we're made to stand with our hands tied above our heads, shackled to the top of a roof of a cell, with a hood placed above it, and that if we slump and fall against it because of fatigue or tiredness 
or sh- simply having lost the ability to stand anymore like this, then the soldiers will come in and punch and kick us to check whether we're faking it or not. And in this manner, two people were killed in front of my eyes. And this is no boast, this is no claim or accusation I make, this is, this is well documented. The two people were killed in Babram. And I can tell you also that although Guantanamo Bay is the place that people like to talk about because it's so easy to hate this place, it's got the signature orange pictures that everybody talks about, the signature orange uniforms. Everybody knows about Guantanamo Bay. But let me tell you that before I went to Guant- Guantanamo Bay, I had to go through a process of being held in secret detention sites, one of them, which, of which was the Bagram Detention Facility, and others. And by the time they finished with you in these places, as far as I was concerned, I was looking forward to going to Guantanamo Bay. I'll say that again, and you won't hear many people say this. I was looking forward to going to Guantanamo. Because the things I'd witnessed and been subjected to in Bagram, I felt that any other movement, any movement out of this place, has to be better. When you've seen people being beaten to death, when you've seen people being dragged across the floor, when you've had your clothes ripped off you with a knife, and you can feel the cold blade against your skin, when you've had dogs salivating over you, when you've had shackles cutting into your skin so that your nerves are numb and you can't feel your arms or your wrists or your ankles, when you've been photographed continuously in the most humiliating of positions, when you've been dragged with a hood placed over your head for every interrogation, when you're made to march bowing, forced to bow with two soldiers pushing you down, when you're made to do all of these things, when you're made to hear the sounds of a woman screaming who you're led to believe is your wife, when pictures of your children are waved in front of you and you're asked what you think has become of them, when you're told that you'd be sent to Egypt for further torture, then I can tell you any movement out of that is something that you'll look forward to. Because these are the types of things that happen in places before they go to Guantanamo Bay. There is a program that's been instilled by the Americans in cahoots with other countries called Extraordinary Renditions, a secret rendition program. And part of that process involves people being kidnapped or abducted, falsely imprisoned and tortured. And one of these cases has great resonance with not just the war on terror, but the war in Iraq, for me on a personal level, very personal level. And that is that in 2001, late 2001, the the Americans announced the capture of a man called Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi, a Libyan man, who they claimed was the most senior high-ranking member of al-Qaeda in captivity at that point. When I was being interrogated in May 2002, members of the CIA, FBI and military intelligence told me and threatened me that I would also be sent to Egypt like this man Ibn al-Sheikh had been sent to had been um, sent to Egypt too and that if I didn't cooperate I would be tortured in the way that he was because once he was sent to Egypt the Americans of course didn't take part in his torture they simply outsourced it to the masters of torture in Egypt and within days he told his whole story but unbeknownst to me part of the story he told was that he as a member of Al-Qaeda was working on obtaining weapons of mass destruction from yes Saddam Hussein I didn't know this at the time but since my release I've learnt that in 2003 Colin Powell stated that we have received credible evidence that Al-Qaeda was working on obtaining weapons of mass destruction from Saddam Hussein and this is cited as one of the main reasons not the only one but one of the main reasons to enter Iraq the frightening thing for me as an individual is that I could have been that man they told me that I was going to go to Egypt I was really convinced I was going to be sent to Egypt and there I would have easily confessed to whatever they asked me to confess to I know that for a fact too and I could have said I was a member of Al-Qaeda and I could have said that I was the one commissioned, sanctioned to obtain weapons from Saddam and on my say-so they could have justified the entry 
and occupation of a country. Ibn al-Shaykh al-Libi has now disappeared. Nobody knows where he is. He's not in Guantanamo Bay. He's not one of the 14 that were sent recently by the Americans from ghost detention sites, which they said previously did not exist. He's not one of those 14. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is said to be the mastermind of September 11th hijackers, has been sent to Guantanamo. But prior to these people being sent to Guantanamo, they were held in secret ghost detention sites. Nobody knows what took place there. Nobody, except for American intelligence and the administration. So this is the type of world that I have returned to. And I thought that perhaps after my return that things might start getting better, that this episode I might be able to put behind me and start campaigning for the release of other people held around. But I didn't know that the world I was entering was going to be one of fear and hatred. And the only antidote I see to the ignorance that breeds the hatred is knowledge. So it's important for me to tell people to try to educate them, if I may be, if I may be um, able to say that, to try to educate them about what's taking place around the world and the price that we in the West are paying, the price that people are in the East are paying, because they are paying a much bigger price than anybody here. And as bad as, as September the 11th was, and as bad and terrible as July the 7th was, it's nowhere near as bad as Iraq or Afghanistan or even Lebanon. Nowhere near. People often say to me, oh, we, we think you're amazing for having survived three years of Guantanamo. And I tell them, it's nowhere near bad as losing your whole family in one precision strike by cruise missiles. It's nowhere near as bad as seeing your children shot dead as many have been killed even today by U.S. soldiers. Today as we speak. It's not as bad as that. People say to me, you know, you've had a child born that you never saw because you were in custody and he was three, he was three years old when you were released. I say that's not as bad as the people who are still there, who have not now seen their children ever for five years. Some people have never seen their kids that have been born. So the human price that each person pays, the human cost of this, is immense. And you want to talk about a radicalization process? Let me tell you something. If you can imagine the average Afghan that's taken into custody, or Iraqi, and I said to you that this is why knowledge is so important. Because knowledge can either be used something for your benefit, or it can be used against you. But one of the things that takes place in Afghanistan in relation to detentions is that a person is taken into custody and he's stripped completely naked. Many people in Afghanistan and in the Muslim world have beards, and much bigger than mine. And it is something sacred to them. But in a flash, that beard that's never been touched is shaved off. In a flash, that person is stripped naked. In a flash, his crevices and orifices are all violated. In a flash, his hair is shaved. In a flash, if he was to look himself in the mirror, he wouldn't recognize himself. He wouldn't be able to recognize himself. And you see a grown man who's fought the Russians, who fought either for or against the Taliban, and whether you like him or not, he's a tough man. But you'll see him cry like a baby because they've violated his honor. And they threw him in a cell, occupied his land, and told him that he is a terrorist in his own land, and that he is the foreigner. And his ideas are foreign. And so eventually when he's released, because he will be released eventually, some are released within weeks, some within months, some within years, but they're released. They go back. And it's not like in the West. People in Afghanistan, in a great part of the world, not just Afghanistan, not just in the Muslim world, in a great part of the world, are parts of extended families. And those extended families are parts of sub-clans, which are part of clans, which are parts of tribes, which, are part, which make up nations and countries. So when they go back, they tell people, this is what the Americans did to me. They violated everything sacred in my life. They tore the Quran up, which most people don't care, it's just pen, and ink. It's just, uh, pen uh, ink and, and paper. But to me, it's sacred. They tore it up in front of me and they threw it in the bucket used for urination and defecation. So he goes back and tells this 
story at a tribal council meeting. And then you wonder, you wonder when they tell us the Taliban attacks have continued and have doubled and increased. Because what they don't tell you is that it's no longer just the Taliban. It's no longer just Al-Qaeda. You're talking about a people that have been occupied. And if people don't understand this concept, let me tell you also that this country was almost occupied. Jersey and Guernsey were, all, were occupied. The Nazis were knocking on the door of Britain. And what policy did they have for the counter-occupation? At Osterley Park, where they trained people, where they had, if you ever read about the real dad's army, what were they planning to do? It wasn't very nice. If the, if the Nazis had occupied this country, what they planned to do wasn't very nice. Because it involved what today would be regarded as terrorist operations. That's what they planned to do to the Nazis. So to somehow accept or to understand that our armies, which are armies of occupation that have gone from the West to Iraq or Afghanistan or elsewhere, have brought in democracy under the barrel of a gun and that the people should expect, uh, accept it. Knowing the history of these places, knowing the history of Afghanistan, they'll never accept a foreign occupation. And what it's doing for us is breeding hatred, animosity, continually on a daily, day-to-day -day basis. And there's one point, point that I want to finish on, which is the point of hope. And I refer back to Northern Ireland again. Because if you remember Jerry Adams and people like that, for those of you who do remember, his voice couldn't be broadcast by the BBC because he had a really bad Irish accent. <laughs> no, seriously. It wouldn't be broadcast on the BBC because it would have been seen to be supporting and glorifying terrorism or giving terrorism the oxygen where, it's not, where it shouldn't be. And yet, it's this man and his organization, Sinn Féin, with which they ended up negotiating with. The very terrorists that they said we wouldn't talk to were the very ones that they did have to talk to to bring about yesterday's peace deal. So the hope that I have is that people will see reason and people will understand that ignorance breeds hatred, hatred breeds violence. And violence is not a, something that we can sustain very long without it coming back to us. And it's important for me also, as a Muslim, to say that before I went, or before I was taken into custody and held in custody, and before Guantanamo, I didn't spend a lot of time with the non-Muslim communities. We were, in a sense, segregated and separated, as is happening more now than before. But one of the things that I have learned since my return is that there are a significant section, significant number of people in this country from varying backgrounds, whether they're Muslim or not, whether they're people of faith or not, that, will ready, be, are, that are ready and have proved themselves to stand up for justice and stand up for what's correct. And for me, it's been an eye-opening experience. Most of the places where I speak, most of the people that I meet are not from my community. They're from other communities who've understood and tried to help and tried to feel sympathy through the outrage that they feel about what's going on and wanting to make the world a better place. So with that, I finish and thank you very much.